consistency condition is exactly that Q should solve in LS. So this is the way a Riemann-Hilbert problem encodes differential relations. It's one of the big uses of it. Now, there is another. So that's, a, I first of all spoke about a, an occurrence of a Riemann-Hilbert problem which comes from out of the blue. This is an occurrence of Riemann-Hilbert problem which is systematic. You give me a differential equation, ODE, or an ordinary difference equation, and there will always be associated with that some Riemann-Hilbert Riemann uh, problem. If you're looking at the Boussinesq equation, you'll again get a Riemann-Hilbert problem on a union of six lines, like the pen pen situation. Now your matrices will be three, three by three, and so on. Now, here's another absolutely remarkable source of uh, Riemann-Hilbert problems, which is a systematic source. Once you recognize one fact, you know that the whole problem is amenable to Riemann-Hilbert analysis, and that's through a class of operators which are called integrable operators. I should mention, of course, that when it comes to the NLS equa equa equation, many people have wor worked on it. The first understanding of what the asymptotic should be when T becomes large was due to Zakharov and Man Manakov. Uh, they didn't use the, these techniques. The, the work was uh, not rigor rigorous, uh, but and it really involved the introduction of Riemann-Hilbert techniques to really prove the thing rigorously. But let me just leave it like that. So now I want to speak about integrable operators. So again, you have some contour, which is oriented, usual business. And we say K is an integrable operator on sigma if K has a kernel, K x y equals the sum of F i of x g i of y, i running from 1 up to n, divided by x minus y. Those are for points x and y on the contour. And uh, to see how the operator acts, you just do the usual kind of integration. So k on h. Good. k of zy. you integrate on the orient the given or uh, orientation. Any operator like this is called an integrable operator, where fi are bounded and the gj's are bounded. Now, uh, these operators have been come up in a special form in many, many different situations. So they first began to be investigated in a, as a group by Shashnovich in the 1960s, but then the people uh, were, who systematically investigated the pro uh, properties were uh, Itz, Itzergen, Kitayev, and Slavnov. It's, maybe I have it wrong. Just. It's, it's again Kapayev and Slavnov, that's right. For example, if we look at the old sine kernel, that's of course just e to the i x, e to the minus i y minus e to the minus i x to the i y upon x minus y. It's exactly of that form. Uh, and many, many other operators which you meet I have this particular form. Now, the most remarkable fact about this operator, which is completely unclear in the beginning, 
is that attached to this operator in a canonical fashion is the Riemann-Hilbert problem, pro uh, problem, in a canonical fashion. And what it means is that any pro problem which involves such operators, say of an, an, uh, an asymptotic problem, gets transferred over to an asymptotic problem about a Riemann-Hilbert Riemann problem for which we have te te technology. So this is what I mean. You see an operator like this coming up, you know you've got a tool in your hand which will enable you to analyze it. So what is this Riemann-Hilbert problem? Is the following. Such operators, integrable operators, four form an algebra. If you add them, you again get one of the same form. If you multiply them, you'll get one, or one of the same, uh, same form. But also, very importantly, it's invariant undertaking in inverses. So if k is integrable, then 1 minus k is also integrable. So it's invariant undertaking in inverses. So here's the fact of the matter. On z, on sigma, v of sigma is defined equal to identity minus 2 pi i f transpose times g, where f is the vector f1, fn, and g is the vector g1. So rank 1 per uh, perturbation. Then, 1 minus k inverse is equal to the identity plus the sum of fi of x, gi of y, i from 1 to n, upon x minus y. So if k has that form, its inverse has this form. And what f is, which is f1 to fn, is just given by m plus minus acting on this vector. And, and g, which is g1 to gn, is equal to m plus inverse, inverse transpose, acting on this vector. Where m solves the normalized Riemann-Hilbert problem normalized Riemann-Hilbert problem sigma v. So I've got my contour. I've got my integral operator. I construct this matrix here. I solve this Riemann-Hilbert problem. In other words, M is analytic off the con 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 contour. It has jump jumps given by V, asymptotic to 1 at infinity. I compute the solution on, on the axis. I take either plus or the minus. It's not going to matter. Act on F. That is going to give me this function here. This is going to give me that function there. And this object here is the inverse. Of the original matrix of the original operator. So this is, if you think about it from a sort of categorical point of view within mathematics, within the category, I mean, you're seeing that the problem of inverting an operator becomes a problem in complex analysis. That's a very strange mixture of things. So let me in my remaining time, let me just give, I've spoken again and again about the steepest de descent method. Let's just, let me just give you a flavor of it by looking at, okay, let me go over here, to solve the Zago strong limit theorem. How do you use it to solve the Zago strong limit theorem? Percy Dyconis uh, spoke a lot about it during his talk. 
as the theorem, Zergo strong limit theorem. So you've got a function phi equals e to the, say, L of z on mod z equal one, which is a circle. And you assume that LK times K, one to infinity, where LK are the Fourier co 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 coefficients of L. And you look at the operator chi phi, which has components JK running from zero up to N. This is the matrix. These are the Fourier coefficients of phi. So you build up the top, toplets matrix of that form. And we're interested in dn, phi, which is just the determinant, phi, and this goes to what? As n goes to infinity, and the answer is it looks like e to the minus n plus 1 L0, so it's the zeroth Fourier co co coefficient of L time plus sum of k LK squared to 1 plus little o. Now, what makes the Zago limit theorem so canonical and so interesting is that when you think about it, when your initial motivation in go or thoughts in going from finite dimensional systems to infinite dimensional systems from linear algebra to fun uh, function analysis, you want to see what ideas you can push for, uh, for, uh, forward. Well, there are going to be topological ideas. Xn goes to x, therefore f of xn goes to f of x, so the function's con uh, continuous. Can you do something similar in this particular case? Now, what's happening is we're going to a situation where n is getting larger and larger. You haven't got a fixed space there. So you haven't got a limit theorem of the kind. There's no clear idea of what you mean by con continuity. You could think of this as a matrix, filling in the first n plus 1 plus n plus 1 block, and then it's getting in bigger. Does the determinant of those things go to the determinant of this very big semi-infinite matrix? Obviously, no, because such a determinant won't, uh, won't exist. So it's not clear how to take this limit. You don't have continuity in any obvious functional analytic sense. That's what makes the problem so interesting. Now, there are many ways of pro pro uh, proving it, but we're speaking about integrable operators. And this is the way you'd approach the pro problem using integrable operators. You observe that if you have a map taking e k to z to the k, so e k are the stan standard vectors, k going from zero up to n, so e zero is the vector one zero zero zero, and so on. So there's a mapping taking you from. Uh, the uh, finite dimensional uh, com complex space into, so this takes you from Cn plus 1 onto Pn, which is the polynomials of order n. Now, what we can introduce is that this mapping will take this operator chi and induce it as an operator on, t on here. So tau of Pn, if you just do the usual mapping back and forth, finite dimensional mapping, this will be a mapping tau, which is equal to the conjugate of the operator chi under this mapping, Tau will take Pn to Pn. Just a change, change of basis, really, right? It'll look like this. Tau in on some polynomial. 
or tau n of z to the k is just the sum of phi j minus k, z to the j, j running from zero to n. No surprise about that. But now if you take some polynomial p belonging to this pn, then tn of p, if you just do the algebra, you, where you substitute for phi, remember phi l is just uh, e to the minus i theta l times uh, uh, phi of e to the i theta d theta over 2 pi i or something like that. It's a Fourier co coefficient of phi, uh, phi l. And so you can substitute this integral here into here. And you'll find that this object here is just the integral over the unit circle of phi of z prime times p of z prime times z over z prime and plus 1 minus 1 upon z minus z prime d bar z. d bar z prime, I guess. So you can just verify that. And one finds, of course, that what that means, tau of this operator is going from Pn to Pn, that Dn, which is the determinant chi phi, is just the determinant of this operator tau n, tau, which is just the determinant of 1 minus k. Well, well uh, let me, okay, maybe I'm jumping the gun a little, then, and let me get back to the tau n of p, is just 1 minus k n of p, where k n is given by this kernel here, which you see immediately is of integrable type. Now, I don't want to jump the gun to, to uh, too much, and you see that this Kn of z, z prime looks like this. It's equal to fi at z, fi at z prime, i running from 1 up to 2, upon z minus z prime, where f is z to the n plus 1, 1. And g has the form z to the minus n minus 1, 1 minus phi upon 2 pi i, n minus 1. Here you've got just minus 1 minus phi, 2 pi i. So this operator is of this form. So this is what it looks like in this particular space. Now, I want to see how this operator 1 minus Kn acts on the whole of L2 of the circle. So I must see what it does, not just to polynomials of degree n, but I must see what happens if, say, K is either less than 0 or K is bigger than n then you can see that 1 minus kn of z to the k is z to the k plus some combination here of phi j minus k z to the j, j equals 1, j equals 0 up to n. That's for k bigger than n and less than n. So it means that if you write down a matrix for the operator in the basis z to the k, There'll be an identity here. There'll be the identity here. This will be 0, this will be 0. This will be 0, this will be 0. Here you'll have your, the action of tau. And there's going to be some stuff over here. That's what Kn looks like in the whole space. But then the determinant of the whole thing is just the determinant of tau. So the determinant of the entire operator is just exactly given 
uh, by this operator 1 minus k, k. And so the conclusion from this fact is that the original dn is just a determinant of 1 minus k and now as an operator acting in the whole of L2 of the circle. k n is a fin finite rank operator, it's certainly trace class. So now, how do we use it? So we use the old trick of looking at the log determinant, which is the trace of the log of 1 minus kn, which is the integral from 0 up to 1 of d by dt, trace of the log tkn, which is equal to minus integral 0 to 1 to the trace of 1 minus t k n dt. Now you see you're in business, because k n is this integral of operator, and we know that that means that the inverse of the operator can be expressed in terms of the original Riemann, Riemann Hilbert problem. Then you can show, if I put tkn, I divide by t here, then tkn is exactly the same as k, except we replace in here phi by phi t, which is look like this 1 minus t plus, uh, or t plus 1 minus t times phi. If you just Put that in there, you'll see that that's what you have. Okay, right. So t k, uh, if you just put t, uh, t k, and it's the same thing as k. We replace phi by that particular object. So it means that this operator here. is just one minus one upon one minus. Uh, up to a sign, minus this, 1 minus t, okay, yeah. So this object here is exactly what is expressed right over here in terms of uh, the solution. So this operator here is something which is exactly expressible in terms of the solution of a Riemann-Hilbert problem. So I just want to give you a little hint how this thing is going to work. All right. Now, and this will take two minutes. Right? No. The Riemann Hilbert problem involves a matrix which has a particular form. And the key fact is that this can be factorized in the following way 1, z to the minus n minus 1, times 1 minus phi t. Phi t is as I gave it there. times 1, 0, times phi t, 0, 0, phi t inverse, times the following, 1, 0, 1, 1 minus phi t inverse. And we're looking at a Riemann-Hilbert problem on a circle. Now you see what the motivation is. If we can somehow move this part inside, this part will be exponentially decreasing. On the other hand, we want to move this part outside, and this will be exponentially decreasing. Then we'll just be left with a Riemann-Hilbert problem on the circle when n is large, but this is a 
just a direct sum of scalar Riemann-Hilbert problems, and we saw how to solve scalar Riemann-Hilbert problems by explicit form, uh, formula. Now, this is done the following way. Here's your original circle. You introduce a smaller circle and a bigger circle. You define M tilde to be M outside here and M tilde to be M over here. Here you define M tilde to be M times the inverse of the right matrix. This one here. This is the right matrix, this is the left. Okay. Uh, all right. Let me put them like this and draw a bigger circle out here. So this is the unit circle. And here you define M tilde to be M times the left matrix. And this M tilde will solve a Riemann-Hilbert pro pro problem in the complement of these three, three circles. But the jump matrix over here is just phi t, phi t, if you think about it. Here it will have the term which involves z to the n in here, the jump matrix over here. The jump matrix here will involve the term z to the minus n. So now you see that as n gets large, this jump matrix is just going to the identity. This one is just going to the identity. What you're left with is just a Riemann-Hilbert problem across the circle, which is a direct sum of two scalar Riemann-Hilbert and completely sol solvable. Filling in the details there is what gives you the precise asymptotic of the problem. The message, just as in the scalar case, you must deform your integrand to a place which is obviously exponential de uh, decreasing and hence you can, and this you've got to do in this particular way. So let me just make a summary st statement. So I've shown you some things about Re uh, uh, Riemann Hilton. What I have not uh, shown you is that in addition to the algebraic pro properties, the asymptotic pro pro properties, what about the analytic pro pro properties? Well, for example, we know something very spe special about the pan pan equations. They have cer certain properties, but if I write down a pan pan equation, how do I know that the pan equations are actually pan equations, other that they have the property? That you can do using Riemann-Hilbert Riemann analysis. Another systematic source, source of Riemann-Hilbert problems which I haven't spoken about are so-called Wiener-Hopf Wiener problems problems. It's an old form of Riemann-Hilbert theory. And I've only given you just an inkling of how the steepest ascent method works uh, in one particular case. Uh, it's a much more extensive theory, and I'll just leave it at that. Okay, thank you for listening. Perhaps it's time for a, a quick question if anybody has one before we go for tea. Any quick question or comment? How do you check that your orthogonal polynomial satisfies that It's an exercise. It's not a difficult exercise. So you, you do it row, row by row. You see, because in the jump matrix, there's a 1 and a 1 and a W there, right? So that means that if you look at the jump relation for the first component, the 1-1 one, one component, it must, it has no jump, must be entire, but it has polynomial growth, so it's a polynomial. When you look at the se second component, you see that this orthogonal polynomial, this polynomial must be orthogonal with respect to certain vectors, and hence it's the, the orthogonal polynomial. But it's an exercise. Once you do it, it's fun. Uh, and uh, I recommend you do it. Okay, well, I do want people to have a
time for tea, but before we go for tea, let's thank Percy again for this lecture and the whole lecture in the series. Thank you.